One of the things Martin Luther King told us was put another city than Pittsburgh on the front of those buses. Put on the front of those buses some southern city. The, the role of God in the movement is too often overlooked. This was a movement of the people of faith. What I think sometimes we unfortunately do is we, we try to separate uh, this thing over here called the Civil Rights Movement and then faith, when really the Civil Rights Movement was people of faith in action. But whenever you, you have the Lord on your side, nothing can turn you around because you ain't going to let nobody turn you around. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Why don't you get out in front of the camera and go on? It's not a matter of being in front of the camera, it's a matter of facing it. your sheriff and facing it. your judge. We're willing to be beaten for democracy, and you misuse democracy in the street. You beat people bloody in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. This man pointing his finger is Reverend C.T. Vivian. Whenever anyone does not have the right to vote, then every man is hurt. The time, 1965 in Selma, Alabama and Reverend Vivian is active in the Civil Rights Movement as part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was led by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Reverend Vivian is leading protesters to the Dallas County Courthouse in the state of Alabama to confront Sheriff Jim Clark. Sheriff Clark was known to forcibly prevent blacks from registering to vote. Cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. You hear him saying, arrest that man, arrest that man, right? Well, a huge guy that should have played the halfback on the Chicago Bears, right? He was huge. And uh, he came over to get me, and they grabbed me, and they took me on over to the jail. As we start up the elevator, this huge guy says, let me beat him, let me beat him. Well, what that meant was, stop the elevator between between floors and just let me beat him for a while. That was practice. That was a normal practice for the whole South. Well, Reverend C.T. Vivian uh, is, in my estimation, one of those civil rights figures who doesn't nearly get the uh, attention and recognition that he deserves. Uh, he was one of those uh, point persons that was out on the ground uh, in many of the places where uh, the movement was coming to months before, long before, uh, the movement would ultimately make a decision to, to, to get there. In 1960, Reverend Vivian organized lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville. He also rode on the first Freedom Bus into Jackson, Mississippi, and participated in many rallies, including the March on Washington, where he heard Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. That one day, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Help me welcome to Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania and Geneva College, a lifelong social justice, activist, pastor, and just all around great human being, Reverend C.T. Vivian. 
Reverend Vivian spoke at Geneva College. There he told students that the world is waiting to see what their generation is all about. Remember, Selma, Alabama was off the map too, but it gave us the most important, uh, most important change in American life when it gave us uh, the voting rights bill. President Johnson addresses a joint session of Congress to push a voting rights bill aimed at ending discrimination. Reverend Vivian also talked about the events before the passage of the voting rights bill. President Johnson, what we need is a voting rights bill. Our people are not allowed to vote in what's supposed to be the greatest democratic country in the world. We brag about it. We got millions of people not voting. We've got to change that. Right? And uh, uh, Johnson says, says, now you know I understand hmm. because I'm from the South myself, right? And I live with these people, I understand. He says, but right now is not the time. So we went down to Selma and made it the time, all right? <laughs> And he stepped back from his paper and said, uh, we and we shall overcome. Uh, uh, and we did, right? And we got the voting rights bill. And as Johnson said, is that the voting rights bill is the most important single piece of legislation in our time. The bill's aim is to bring to fruition the goal of minority groups that have staged protests throughout the nation. I think if we don't hear these stories, it's when we lose touch uh, with these stories. I mean, there are, ha have been promising signs uh, over the years that, that not that we've overcome uh, racism, uh, if you will, but that we, we're, we're taking steps in the right direction. Um, have we reached the dream or achieved the dream? Uh, I don't think we have. I thought I, that I knew a lot about the movement, and then I was introduced to a fellow named Reverend Robert Gretz, uh, a Lutheran pastor who pastored an all-black congregation in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, who when he went there uh, was just trying to, you know, learn and, and grow as a pastor. Uh, really wasn't thinking about getting involved in uh, a civil rights movement, to say. Uh, but then one day, uh, his good friend and next door neighbor, Rosa Parks, got arrested. And kind of as the cliche goes, you know, the rest is history. Why don't we bow our heads for a moment of prayer? Reverend Robert Gretz and his wife Jeannie are not well known outside of Alabama, but to many there, they are unsung heroes. This man is a very special man. This man was the pastor of a black church in a black community. And when he took up the fight, with the rest of the black people, he became like a black person to the enemies who were against us. In 1955, Reverend Gretz was called to serve an all-black Lutheran church in Montgomery, Alabama. When they got there, he and his wife chose to live among their parishioners. We were very comfortable living in African-American communities and interestingly enough, some years before, like about 40 years before, when that congregation in Montgomery was established, it was white missionaries who established the congregation. So they had had white pastors there before, but not as a part of the community. They lived in the white community and served the congregation in the black community. We were the first ones who actually lived right in the neighborhood. Montgomery is carrying on a more than year-long celebration of the 50th anniversary of the bus boycott. But Reverend Gretz and his wife Jeannie didn't just live there. They were active, visibly active. So when their next door neighbor Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, not only did they support her, they also took part in the Montgomery bus boycott, something very few whites did at the time. Sunday morning, First thing I did was announce to the congregation, stay off the buses tomorrow. I'll be out in my car. If you need a ride, I'll take you to work, or <laughs> wherever you need to be. In a sense, I was the token white person. There were many white people who were very supportive of what we were doing, but who could not be as public as I was. Since I was serving a black congregation, 
the white community did not control my income <laughs> and they could not fire me. So I was able to be very public, which meant that white people had to realize this was in a very limited sense, but, but in a very real way, it was a bicultural experience. But it wasn't easy. Like others involved in the civil rights movement, the Gretz family was threatened. And Dr. King used to say to us, if you're not ready to die, you have no business sitting in this meeting, you should leave now. So we all had to face death and, and reconcile ourselves to the reality that some of us were going to die. We assumed that Dr. King was the prime target. We also assumed that since I was the only white person in the room, that I was likely to be a, a high on the target list. And the fact that we, there were several attempts on, a, on our lives. The most difficult part was people would threaten our children. They threw things at the house. They uh, put sugar in our gas tank. They slashed our tires. And then there were three bombs thrown at our house at different times, uh, two of which went off. The one that did not go off was large enough the demolitions people told us it would have leveled the entire neighborhood and many people would have been killed. Now, more than 50 years later, still committed to social justice, Reverend Gretz has written a book about his civil rights experience. It's called A White Preacher's Message on Race and Reconciliation. We thought, well, just for the sake of history, we need to add our recollections to the, to the body of knowledge that's available. Uh, a second thing is that we think we have a unique perspective. Being uh, growing up white and now living black for a number of years and being totally involved in both communities, uh, there aren't that many people who have that perspective and we need to share that so that people can understand that. A third thing is that the, the role of God in the movement is too often overlooked. This was a movement of the people of faith. President Johnson sends to Congress a bill to reinforce the right to vote. We knew what we were getting into. The president signs an accompanying letter to the legislators urging swift passage for the bill that would outlaw discriminatory practices. This was not a student field trip. The bill's aim is to bring to fruition the goal of minority groups that have staged protests throughout the nation. But we didn't know enough to be as afraid as we were once we got there. <laughs> this is a demonstration in Montgomery, Alabama, led by Dr. Martin Luther King. I remember the feelings better than I remember the events. In contrast to the violence of many marches, this one is held peacefully with police blessing and under permit. Because it was such a, well, it was the most powerful lesson I ever had in my life. The day before, the marchers had been dispersed by state troopers and sheriff's deputies when they marched without a permit. My name is Sister Patricia McCann. I'm a Sister of Mercy here in Pittsburgh. I was teaching at, uh, we called it then Mount Mercy College, Carlo University. I taught history there. I had been very interested in civil rights really all through high school because of the teachers I had in high school who raised issues and directed us to read things about civil rights and about uh, segregation. The long-anticipated Freedom March from Selma to Alabama's capital of Montgomery finally gets underway. We heard that they were staging a march from Montgomery to connect with the Selma marchers. And so uh, four busloads of students from Pitt, Duquesne, Mount Mercy went to participate in that march. For the first day, there are 3,200 marchers in line. We were supposed to connect with the Selma March. We were marching under the auspices of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC it was called. And uh, we were, our, our hope was, it was all students, our hope was to connect with the Selma Marchers and to just expand this march. There are a few isolated flare-ups between whites and Negroes, but otherwise the demonstration is peaceful. The first we went straight there. We were stopped in Birmingham by the Birmingham police because I think they figured out who we were, I mean, that we were coming to join these marches. And they didn't want to let us go on. And the police there boarded the bus, they went all through, that was scary and, and you know. Uh, but uh, one of the faculty people uh, told the police that we were on an educational trip through the South, which was honest. <laughs> it was more educational than we ever realized it would be. <laughs>
We got to Montgomery and there were hundreds of students there from colleges all over the country. That was kind of a euphoric feeling of being caught up in something important and good that was happening. The march started early in the morning and there had been a lot of training for the students in nonviolence and nonviolent behavior. And we were singing hymns, you know, We Shall Overcome and oh, all kinds of the civil rights hymns and gospel hymns. There were hundreds of kids, college kids from all over. And we began to march toward the Capitol and we had a permit to march. But these policemen on horseback appeared from everywhere. And they were what you've seen on television. You know, they had the, the billy clubs with the whips on the end, you know. Uh, that was just so sobering. And they began to try to scatter the marchers, to try to break up the march. And they were going among the kids with, on these horses, you know, and with the whips going. Uh, in the morning when we walked that, we saw cars parked all along the street, cars with three and four men in them, white men. And it began to dawn on us that they were probably KKK. And that was a very scary feeling. I mean, it was real clear. They were watching the marchers. They were not watching as if they were cheering us on, you know. During that time, the police, some of them on motorcycles, came right into the neighborhood. And there was a, a young black man who had been with the marchers, and they had him down on the street. I can still see this in my mind. The motorcycle astride him. He, he wasn't run over in the sense of he wasn't, you know, they didn't run him down with the motorcycle, but they were holding him down with the motorcycle. We didn't know what they were going to do to him, and we were so upset and so, you know, just wanting to try to relieve that situation. But it was a real clear experience of what people had gone through for months, years down there. I met a man, a black man, who had been a Marine, who was in World War II, who was on Iwo Jima, the Battle of Iwo Jima in World War II, who came home with a Purple Heart, and who told me his story of never having been able to vote in an American election, because when he went to vote, uh, the test they required of him was that he be able to write the Constitution, which, of course, I mean, I was a problems of democracy teacher. I couldn't write the Constitution. So um, that was, that just stayed in my head so much that um, this is something we just have to keep doing no matter what it costs. We have to fight this battle because this is not a situation Americans can live with. The parade passes through the heart of Montgomery, past the state capitol to the county courthouse a mile from the starting point. The street was filled with people. You know. There were still a few police about on the motorcycles, but there weren't as many as there had been. By this time, there were a lot of TV cameras. There were, you know, kids, students, I mean, all kinds. The street was filled with people. Today, troopers and deputies are absent. Only city police line the route of march. And uh, all of a sudden, Martin Luther King was there. He was walking down the street. There were people with him, and I don't know who they were but he's walking down the street. And so he went and he talked to some of the police and he talked to some of the uh, student leaders who were milling around down in the street. And being in the habit, we were, you know, real <laughs> visible, which and I, I think of that sometimes now and realize that was a symbol that was very, very um, meaningful symbol in that kind of context. But he came over to us. We were in the crowd, he was there. And he came over and thanked us for coming, thanked us for being willing to stand with them in the, the battle for civil rights. Yeah, we, we met him right there in the street in Montgomery. The Freedom March has been an historical venture in nonviolent protest. The songs of the movement played a very important role in the civil rights movement.
because they gave you hope and joy and they kept you moving. took away a lot of fear, which most of us had. Ministers and civil rights workers reach the end of the bridge where the cordon of troopers stand. They are ordered to turn back. Don't let nobody tell you that they were afraid, because we were afraid. But whenever you, you have the Lord on your side, and nothing can turn you around, because you ain't going to let nobody turn you around. Ain't going to let nobody Turn me around, turn me around, turn me around, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. My name is Ruth May Harris. I'm one of the original freedom singers of the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. I started singing at the age of eight years old <laughs> in my dad's church in the junior choir. And in, let's see, I was in the eighth grade when I did my first solo in middle high school. I love life and I want to live. I love life. <laughs> But I've been singing ever since. Most of the singing was done with congregational, with a group leading the audience, as the songs conveyed the message which moved the audience to action. A crowd could quickly be turned into a community. The people joined in when they knew the songs. That is why new words were put to spirituals, gospels, and rhythm and booze. And we did this to mobilize people toward a goal and to make the issue clear. The Ark of Song focused attention on injustices and formalized expression about them. These songs simply stated, we are here and we are here. Just 100 years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves, 200,000 people converge on the nation's capital to rally for civil rights. I will always remember uh, driving, not me driving, but riding in the car in Alabama that we were shot at. I will also remember the March on Washington, and we performed at the March on Washington. To keep your mind stayed on freedom. It ain't no hope. Stay on freedom. There's a, there's a song that says, um, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. No, it ain't no hope. Stay on freedom. That song was taken from a spiritual that says, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Uh, the songs that we sang were taken from spirituals, the gospels, the rhythm and blues, and we just changed the lyrics to fit the occasion. My brothers, I'm glad. I'm glad to have the opportunity to tell people today that they're sleeping in a dangerous time. Segregation is our enemy. Just like a pail of garbage in the alley. It shall, it must be removed. Segregation is our enemy. It must be, it must be. Segregation is our enemy. Being treated unequal, being able not to drink out of, out of a water fountain that was not uh, colored and white, not being able to visit sleeping hotels, not being able to go to restaurants and sit down and eat, not being able to go into a service station when you stop to buy gas. If you traveled, you couldn't sleep in a hotel, and if you had to use the restroom, you had to use it in outside. And that was real terrible, you know. If you want to go on a trip or you go in the bus station, white waiting room, black waiting room. In my belief, without freedom songs, there would not have been a movement of nonviolence. 
because they say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say that without the songs we may not have stayed strong spiritually, mentally or physically enough to follow a nonviolent course as Dr. They King believed. Had we not had those songs, I don't think we would have been able to do that. It's a constant struggle. We've been struggling so long. We must be free. Today's Songs of Freedom speaks loudly during social unrest. They say that freedom is a constant dying. Today's Song of Freedom plays a role of teaching the history of the movement. Freedom is a constant dying. So we have to tell the story, and if we don't tell it, it will not get told. It's a constant dying. We've been dying so long. We must be free. We must be free. Go on around.